hands together for George. We all like playing games. From Monopoly to Trivial Pursuit, Farmville and Fortnite, handball and football. My earliest memories of games is of playing dominoes with my grandfather. I would spend all afternoons with him and listening to the stories of his youth. I also remember playing Monopoly with my siblings. A single game would last for days. We made our own rules and shaped the game in order to improve the excitement and prolong the experience. But at that time, I wasn't even aware of that. As I grew up, I started playing games in consoles and PC, and most of them were not translated in my language, which was quite a challenge. So by playing those games, I learned English. And by the time I was having English classes in school, I knew a lot, whereas my classmates could barely speak a word. Playing games helps us learn new things. They challenge our brains, and they develop our skills. And they are fun. Why do we sit behind a monitor for hours straight? Or why do we look at cardboard squares like playing cards can save or ruin our lives? Why? Because it's fun. But we can take that fun a step further. We can do more than stop life and start playing games. We can gamify everything we do. And today I'm here to tell you how you can do that yourself, how you can gamify your world. I'm going to help you change your surroundings in a way that you can do whatever you want and have fun at the same time. For that, I'm going to use a concept called the Octalysis Framework. This will help me explain you the basics. Like, what is it that drives you to play a game? What motivates you to do it? And that's where the Octalysis Framework comes in. It shows us what makes us play games. Every action has a motivation behind it. And there are eight core drives perfectly spread through this octagonal shaped framework. Now I can go through each one of them, tell you what they mean, how you can use them, yada, yada, yada. But I'm going to do something else. One of my favorite games of all time is The Legend of Zelda, the first one from 1986. I hope some of you, like, some faces I'm seeing now <laughs> have played it before. Then this will be a feast of recognition. For those of you that didn't play it or didn't know it, well, I hope it will be a reason for you to play it. Otherwise, you're really missing out. And it starts like this. In the land of Hyrule, Ganon, the Prince of Darkness, steals the Triforce of Power, bestowing him with great strength. In order to prevent him from getting the Triforce of Wisdom, Princess Zelda steals it and splits it into eight different parts, spreading them throughout the land of Hyrule in the most darkest and ancient dungeons. A young boy named Link, by her listening to this, decides to take upon him the quest of reassembling the Triforce of Wisdom and with it, hope to defeat Ganon, restore peace to the kingdom and save his princess. Sorry, just love this song. <laughs> okay, let's get real then. This takes us to our first core drive. Epic meaning and calling. It is when someone believes that they are doing something bigger than themselves, or they were chosen to do something. 
like our hero, Link. He just decided to take a quest bigger than himself to save his princess and kingdom from an evil tyrant. This is a positive motivator. It makes you feel good and powerful. Wikipedia is a good example of this, where people devote their time because they believe they are preserving humanity's knowledge. It is also the core drive that makes you recycle or buy fair trade products. Moving on, at the beginning of our journey, our hero, Link, is alone, with only a shield to protect him. He needs help, and in the land of Hyrule, help comes from the old man. And there are lots of them spread throughout the kingdom, like this guy, or that guy, or that one. <laughs> they provide our hero with gear, like his first wooden sword. With it, he travels through the land fighting the army of Ganon. The further he travels, by fighting his enemies and discovering new, different, and stronger enemies, he learns of the existence of a magical sword. It's a very rare sword, and in order for him to wield it, he needs to improve his skill. So he's gonna train over and over again, mastering his craft, so he's able to defeat his enemies way easier. This part is full of extrinsic core drives. We have development and accomplishment, ownership and possession, and scarcity and impatience. And these are all the core drives that make you want to get something. In this case, the magical sword. Just look at it. You already own a sword, but you want to improve it by getting a better one. You also want it because it's rare and you cannot have it right now. And at the same time, if you want to have it, you need to improve yourself. Now, as a collector, myself, these core drives are extremely important to me. I'm that person that when I'm playing a game, I'm gonna look for all the hidden and rare items, save them in my inventory, even though I know I'm probably never gonna touch them. So, I actually am like that when I play games, but also in real life. And my earliest memory of that, it's when I started collecting all the toys that would come in the Kinder Surprise eggs. <laughs> Unfortunately, I could never finish an entire set. Because my parents at that time, they didn't believe that Kinder Chocolate was good for me. So I couldn't get as many as I wanted. But, uh, uh, oh yeah, and that led me to, well, end up with a collection of unfinished collections. But I loved it. And that two tiny shelves, sorry, I had two tiny shelves <laughs> to display them in my room. And as you've probably seen by my uh, nervous clicking, <laughs> now that I'm a grown-up, sort of, I have that own spot at my place, reserved for all my collection of nerdy games, movies, Funko characters, you name it. And yeah, I didn't Google this. This is my spot. <laughs> and I'm quite proud of that Witcher 3 uh, um, Collector Edition statue, actually. Really loved it. Well, I want you to think about your life goals or your work. Are you someone that always wants to keep improving? Or maybe you lead a team and want your team members to be motivated. Give them ownership of their work. When someone feels ownership over something, they naturally want to increase and improve what they own. Or maybe you just want to do something that nobody else can do. Back to our story in Hyrule, Link reassembles the Triforce of Wisdom and then is looking for the hideout of Ganon. He finds it and it's 
the most incredible place he has seen before. It's packed with ferocious animals and full of secret doors. At some point, he finds out where the enemy is hiding. And the final battle begins. Now our hero is confident he's going to be able to defeat this enemy. And he keeps fighting him over and over again with his sword, but he remains undefeated. Throughout his journey, he collected a lot of magical items, and he tries to use them to defeat the enemy. He uses his boomerang, bombs, a magical rod, even a candle, but nothing seems to work until he's going to use a silver arrow. And that was the key to defeat the enemy. Collecting the Triforce of Wisdom, Link saves Princess Zelda. And with it, he restores peace to the kingdom and gives her back the Triforce of Power. This completes our awesome, exciting story. Now, at this part, we are full of uh, intrinsic core drives, but also a good balance between positive and negative motivators. We have unpredictability and curiosity, loss and avoidance, and empowerment of creativity and feedback. The first one is that feeling you get when you want to know what's going to happen next. So imagine that you're reading a book or watching a movie or playing a game and you want to keep reading and watching and playing so you can find out what's going to happen next. When you're near the end and you're not sure that you're going to make it through and you think everything is going wrong, the loss and avoidance score drive is going to get you through it. It's that little voice inside your head that tells you not to quit because otherwise you would feel like everything you did until now was worthless. These are two negative uh, core drives. They will definitely make you do something, but in the long run, it will leave a bad taste in your mouth. To balance this out, we have empowerment of creativity and feedback. Now, one of my favorite things to do when I was a kid was play with Legos. I would lay the Legos, all the Legos that I had on the ground. You remember. <laughs> I would lay all the Legos in the ground and build anything out of my imagination. I would build cars, boats, houses, anything that a little kid would do. And it's in a, in a process like that, in a creative process, where you repeatedly try new things out, you're going to look at the results of your work and getting feedback from others and improve every time you do that. OK, now that we went through the core drives, at this point, you have some clear idea of what are the core drives that will make you or someone else to do something. I want you to think about how you can use them and combine them in your real life so that you can get the most fun out of whatever you do. So before you go, I would like to ask you to think about one thing, just one thing, that you do on a daily basis, either at home or at your job. And then spawn that creative mind and combine these core drives and try to get the most fun out of that task. And I'll give you an example. Every time I wash dishes, I don't have a dishwasher, so I have to do it by hand, I always want to, to waste the least amount of water possible and the least amount of soap. And also, like, wash them as fast as I can. And yeah, they will be clean in the end. Don't worry about it. So, <laughs> so in that, when I, when I tell you that, you could say, well, Epic meaning is saving resources for a better environment, something greater than himself. Yes, that's in there. But actually, what gets me going? It's development and accomplishment. Because I really want to get better over and over and like wash them one after the other 
and waste the less time possible. It's a competition for me. I also talked with a good friend of mine before I made this talk, Kuhn, which I don't, cannot see in here, but Kuhn, if you know him, is a baseball, uh, is a baseball teacher. And he teaches, oh, there he is. <laughs> Kuhn is a baseball teacher for kids. And like any other sport, at baseball, you have to repeat a lot of movements to get better. Now imagine doing that as a kid. It can get quite boring. So what he does, he always makes a competition out of those trainings. And when looking at this, I saw, OK, well, then you're using empowerment in there um, so that they repeat the, their trainings over and over again uh, and get better. And you also have social influence, so they're doing that in a team. And then, OK, but what about the kids that don't like competitions? What do you do with them? How do you motivate them? Maybe you can use ownership. Give them a specific task at the training for them to be uh, empowered and by the ownership of uh, being uh, in charge of something. It can work. So try this at home and try to get the most fun out of whatever you do. And if you don't want to, well, at least play Zelda, because it's a freaking awesome game. Thank you.